Hey everybody, this is Matt Atkinson, and you're watching Four Gettysburg with Aaron Smith. Welcome everybody to another episode of Forward Gettysburg. As always, I am your host, Aaron Smith. Thank you guys so, so much for joining me. As always, if you guys are enjoying the videos, if you're enjoying the channel, if you're enjoying the content about the Gettysburg campaign and the Civil War at large, please remember to like this video, leave me a comment, let me know your thoughts, and also subscribe to the channel. I cannot tell you guys how much I appreciate all of the support, all of the feedback, everything you guys have been doing in the comment section. Um, I'm finally on Facebook, so if you want to find me, go ahead and look me up, Aaron Smith. Um, personal Facebook, but sure, I'll be your friend. Why not? Let's talk about the Civil War or something like that. Maybe we'll meet up in Gettysburg for some drinks down at the Blue and Gray. Today, we are talking about George Gordon Meade, and this is going to be the first part in a multi-part series discussing Meade at Gettysburg. I am joining you today from the Widow Leicester House here, just on the back end of Cemetery Ridge, and this house was George Gordon Meade's headquarters. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. Today we are going to discuss the union positions and the genius behind those union positions here at Gettysburg. Thank you guys so, so much for joining me. So anybody with just a small amount of knowledge about the Battle of Gettysburg knows about the famous union fish hook. And the fish hook line, if you will, running from Culp's Hill all the way over to East Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Hill running down Cemetery Ridge down to the Round Tops has some distinct advantages. So first of all, we talk a lot about interior lines. What does interior lines mean? Interior lines simply mean that there is a shorter distance between any point on that line, on the Union line, that, that is, it's a shorter distance that they can reinforce the line with. And we see that happening on day two of the action here at Gettysburg. We have Longstreet's attack over there on the Union left flank. They are smashing in. We know that Dan Sickles, that dastardly, dastardly dog, Dan Sickles, moved his soldiers forward from the original line whose left would have rested somewhere on Munchower's Knoll on the north face of Little Round Top. He moves his line forward. And the interior lines are going to help support and, and, and shore up that line of Dan Sickles. Now, ultimately, we know Dan Sickles can't hold that position, but Meade has positioned the Fifth Corps under Sykes. He has positioned them in the area of Powers Hill. Powers Hill being a hill just south uh, along Baltimore Street. You, you can actually visit it today. It's actually a really, really cool place, an underrated place on the battlefield, a place that's not as popular as your little round top, your Devil's Den, even Culp's Hill, because no actual fighting occurred there, but it's still an important, important, integral aspect to the battle here at Gettysburg. So the Fifth Corps comes in, they're positioned at Powers Hill. They're kind of just chilling in reserve. That attack happens on the left flank of the Union line, and now the Fifth Corps is sent to reinforce that area. But if a large attack had happened on the right flank, that Fifth Corps, those men of the Fifth Corps, they were positioned in such a place that they could have reinforced Culp's Hill as well. Or if a large attack happened in the center of the line, if a large attack came from the town of Gettysburg by the Confederates toward uh, Cemetery Hill, they could have reinforced there as well. So we see the power of interior lines. Meade has a shorter distance to reinforce his line to protect from attack. Whereas Robert E. Lee, he had the distinct disadvantage of exterior lines. Lee's line, if you were to try to reinforce from his far left flank all the way over there on Culp's Hill, Benner's Hill, that area, if he were to try to reinforce and take troops from that area and say the Union were to attack him, he would have to march his troops somewhere in the area of five miles from one end of the line all the way, other to, all the way around to the other end of the line. Whereas Meade, any point in his line is no more than 
two miles, a mile and a half, something like that, something in that area. So Mead has a distinct advantage of interior lines. So behind me stands the Mead Equestrian Statue, a beautiful statue staring off in the direction of Seminary Ridge, ready to intercept any attack from the rebels. But more importantly, what I want to get to, behind that statue, you might be able to make out the Pennsylvania Monument. Mead himself was a Pennsylvania man born in Philadelphia. Further beyond that, we can see the round tops looming over the left flank of the Union line on that area of the southern battlefield here at Gettysburg. Now due to popular culture and, and the portrayals and media of, of the brave and valiant efforts of the 20th Maine, Little Round Top has become the premier destination for tourists here at Gettysburg. But Little Round Top itself is a rather unassuming bald hill wooded on the backside. Not, not a great place for artillery, but Mead and his chief engineer, Governor K. Warren, they realize the importance of Little Round Top, not for cannon placement or, or reinforcement by soldiers, which in, in and of itself could be important, but it has to do with the roads. Now, Meade only controls two roads into Gettysburg, the Tawny Town Road and the Baltimore Pike. And these two roads are key to Meade's position. Both of those roads eventually lead toward Westminster and lead toward Baltimore and Washington, D.C. When Meade took over the army on June 28, 1863, his orders from General-in-Chief Henry Halleck and Abraham Lincoln himself, the President of the United States, those orders were to protect Baltimore and Washington from the Southern invaders, two key cities in the Union, in the Mid-Atlantic, in the Eastern Theater, Baltimore and Washington, of course, the nation's capital, and Baltimore, a large port in Maryland. Not only that, not only were those Meade's orders, but Meade had a railhead in Westminster, Maryland. Westminster being a, a city uh, probably about 20 miles, maybe, maybe a little bit less south of Gettysburg, the county seat of Carroll County. It was an important rail terminus. Meade had to protect these two roads. Now, there are 10 roads that meet at Gettysburg. Meade only controlled two of them. So when the South attacks on his left flank, no doubt they are going to be aiming for that Tawny Town Road. Lee himself more than likely has access to maps around the area. Lee knows his position of his troops, what roads he controls, and he very likely assumes that the Tawny Town Road and the Baltimore Pike, no, he more than likely knows those are Meade's routes of retreat. So if he can attack that left flank and make his way and control Little Round Top, control that area, he can control the Tawny Town Road, cutting off one of Meade's supply lines and routes of retreat if things were to go south here for the Union at Gettysburg. So I'm currently on what would have been the right flank of the Union line. This monument here to my left is the monument to the second Massachusetts. And a little fun fact for you, this was the first permanent regimental marker on the field here at Gettysburg. Now further on behind me runs Spangler Spring. There's the beautiful Indiana monument just over there. And then further beyond dominating the right end of the Union line is Culp's Hill. Now, Culp's Hill gets a bad rap. The, the National Park Service does a program called Culp's Hill, the forgotten flank. And indeed, the right flank of the Union line is a forgotten flank. If we take a look at the book, The Killer Angels, if we take a look at the movie Gettysburg, and I reference those because those are two of the most popular forms of media that draw an interest in people to Gettysburg. If we take a look at those two pieces of media, that novel and that stunning movie, while great pieces, very entertaining, they forget Culp's Hill. And Culp's Hill, in my humble opinion, is probably the more important hill here at Gettysburg, and probably the most important hill for the Union. Now, Culp's Hill wasn't originally occupied. Of course, we have day one. The Union, they're smashed by the oncoming hordes of Confederates, and they retreat back 
first to Seminary Ridge there at the Lutheran Seminary, and then further on through town to Cemetery Hill. And Cemetery Hill, while no doubt an incredibly important hill, I feel like it gets the spotlight. It takes away from Culp's Hill. Now, the reason Culp's Hill is so important to Meade and his line here at Gettysburg is the Baltimore Pike. Now, if you remember when I was back over on Cemetery Ridge and we were talking about Little Round Top and the Tawny Town Road, same thing here. Whoever controls Culp's Hill controls the Baltimore Pike. And the Baltimore Pike was essential. It was absolutely essential to the Union line here. That was its main route of retreat. If it had to fall back, it could fall back along the Baltimore Pike to that pipe Creek line, which we are going to get into in another episode in our series here about Meade. If they had to fall back and defend Baltimore, or if they had to fall back and defend Washington, the Baltimore Pike is how they were going to do that. And also, probably more essential, is that was Meade's supply line. And the last thing Meade wanted to happen is to lose control of that Baltimore Pike. And they came very, very close to doing that on the evening of July 2nd. Of course, we know the left flank of the Union line, Longstreet, you know, the divisions of Hood, the divisions of McClaws, they are pummeling away on that left flank at Devil's Den, the wheat field, the peach orchard, they are pummeling away. So what Meade is going to do is he is going to send away most of the 12th Corps, which was posted in this area behind me. He is going to send away a majority of the 12th Corps to go and reinforce that part of the field. Now the 12th Corps, they go on a long journey. They end up going down the Baltimore Pike, down towards Rock Creek, totally wrong direction, leaving only a single brigade under George Sears Green here at Culp's Hill. Meanwhile, Johnson's Confederate Division, somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,500 to 6,000 men, they are attacking this area. So a single brigade is fighting off an entire division. But here we get into the super underrated genius of George Sears Green. He is going to reinforce that position with his single brigade of around 1,400 men with breastworks, fallen logs, uh, head logs, all sorts of things, turning Culp's Hill into a formidable fortress. And I've done quite a few episodes on Culp's Hill and George Sears Green, so I won't get too much into the weeds here. But it's important to note that the Confederates came within 500 yards of taking the Baltimore Pike here at Culp's Hill. So we've talked about the left flank, we've talked about the right flank. Let's take a look at the center of Meade's fish hook line on Cemetery Hill. So I'm currently on top of Stevens Knoll, named after Alexander Stevens, the Vice President of the Confederacy. Just kidding. I wanted to see if any of you guys would catch that. No, no, this is named after Stevens' 5th Main Battery, which was posted here on July 2nd. And this battery is going to pound away at the oncoming Confederates as they assaulted East Cemetery Hill directly behind me. In the background, you can probably make out the beautiful, gorgeous gatehouse of the Evergreen Cemetery here at Gettysburg, a building that was here during the time of the battle. And that brings us to the center of the Union line, Cemetery Hill. Now, in my humble opinion, I feel Culp's Hill is the more important hill, but a lot, of, a lot of scholars, a lot of Gettysburg researchers, they're going to tell you Cemetery Hill. And for a good reason, that they think it's the most important hill at the battle here. I just realized I don't have my hat on, so it's a little bit chilly. But <laughs> either way, Cemetery Hill, this is the position the Union line is going to fall back to. This is going to be their regrouping, their reforming position at the end of day one. Of course, we start to get into the controversy of was it practicable for Yule and his second corps to take Cemetery Hill for the Confederates at the end of day one. And it's going to prove a, a costly mistake that they don't take the hill because Cemetery Hill is going to be the hill that the Union develops their line from for the rest of the battle here at Gettysburg into day two and day three. They're going to reinforce Cemetery Hill with all manner of cannon. There are going to be troops posted there, 
East Cemetery Hill is going to have troops posted on it as well. Some of the remnants of the 11th Corps, they're going to be posted up there on East Cemetery Hill. And on that evening of July 2nd, while there's fighting going on with Allegheny Johnson's division assaulting Culp's Hill, we are going to have Early's division assaulting East Cemetery Hill. And it's probably going to be the closest the Confederates come to dislodging the Union positions here at any point during the battle. They're going to make it to the top of the hill. They're going to capture some batteries up there, but eventually the reinforcements are going to push them back off that hill. But Cemetery Hill is no doubt the highest point here at the Gettysburg battlefield. From the top of Cemetery Hill, you can see all the way down to Cemetery Ridge, to the Round Tops, down the Emmitsburg Road. You can see all the way over here to Culp's Hill. You can see over towards the east of town as well, along the York Road, the Hanover Road, all those roads there running to the east. So Cemetery Hill is going to be almost like the epicenter. It's going to be the the anchor of the Union line. The entire line is going to form off of Cemetery Hill. And Cemetery Hill is at an intersection of those two important roads we discussed earlier in the video, the Tawny Town Road and the Baltimore Pike. They are almost going to meet right where Cemetery Hill is at. So it is an incredibly important position for Meade here at Gettysburg. So I've been alluding to it throughout the entire video. I haven't quite said it yet. We talked about the strength of interior lines, but also Meade has the high ground at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania on July 2nd and 3rd. And those two things are going to be keys to victory for the North here at the Battle of Gettysburg. Well, thank you guys so, so much for joining me today on Forward Gettysburg. I love talking about Mead. I, I feel that in media, in books, in movies, the story is always about Robert E. Lee's invasion of the North, and Meade kind of takes a back seat. But what Meade is able to do from June 28th to July 1st is nothing short of remarkable. And we're going to discuss that in further, further videos of this multi-part series talking about Meade at Gettysburg. If you guys are interested in Meade at Gettysburg, please check out the book by Kent Masterson Brown, Meet at Gettysburg, A Study in Command. It is an incredible book. It is an eye-opening book. Sure, I have some gripes to pick. He, he messes up the order of battle for the 11th Corps on day one, but uh, you know, everybody makes mistakes. I'm certainly not perfect. and I'm certainly not a scholar putting out publications at, at any rate, but, but it's an incredible book. It is very eye-opening. It makes you realize just how much work Meade had in front of him when he took command of the Army of the Potomac on, July, on June 28th, 1863, and just how far he came to lead his troops to a victory here at Gettysburg. As always, I'm your host, Aaron Smith. Again, if you guys are enjoying the channel, please remember to subscribe, like the video, leave me a comment. I'm so close to hitting that 1,000 subscriber mark, I can almost taste it. And of course, I'm also very close to reaching that monetization point for YouTube. So if I can start to get, you know, even a small check from YouTube every month or what, however they do it, I'm going to put that directly back into the channel to travel, to, to improve the equipment, to improve the sound quality, all these types of things. So please remember to subscribe to the channel. It's incredibly supportive for my goal here at bringing the Battle of Gettysburg and the Gettysburg Campaign to you fine viewers at home. As always, I'm your host, Aaron Smith. This has been Forward Gettysburg, and I will catch you on the next one.